All right, so let me give a quick recap of what this declaration says. Basically, it's it's a document about the dignity of the human person, uh, and it says that you know all people have dignity that they're born with that cannot be taken away from them for any reason, even if they lose their mental or physical capacities. On the gender and sexuality fronts, uh, it condemns the criminalization of homosexuality. It also condemns gender theory and sex changes, and its justification for that is that it eliminates the difference between genders and undermines undermines the family. It also has a condemnation of surrogacy, uh, which it says violates a child's right to a fully human rather than artificially induced origin and violates the connection between a chi- the child and the mother who gives birth to them. So there's a lot going on here. Sam, I want to start with you. You have a real gift for getting past polarization and seeing to the heart of the matter in your news analysis. So what is your read of this document? So I, I think one place to start is by also filling out the list of the other things that the the document listed as offenses to human dignity, which include war, the mistreatment of migrants, poverty. Um, it restates Pope Francis's opposition to the death penalty, to abortion. So this is not, it's not just a document about sexuality issues. Um, it is broader than that as a document about human dignity. And I think one thing that's that's helpful to do, and what I tried to do in a piece I wrote about this, is to look not just at the fourth section of the document that provides this catalog of uh, things that are opposed to human dignity or that can end up being uh, violations of human dignity, but also to look at the first three sections, which really lays out the development of the church's teaching on human dignity. Because, look, I... I don't think anyone in the Vatican is under the impression that everyone will suddenly and instantly agree with the whole list in section four of the document just because it's been presented this way. And I also think you know one way that's helpful to get past the initial polarizing response is to not approach these kind of documents from the church as if they're meant to elicit instant automatic agreement from every Catholic. That's just not the way church teaching works. We we absorb it more slowly, and sometimes parts of it are challenging. Uh, parts of it call for a change in our own thinking and approach, um, but it's also a teaching that gets articulated over time. So one of the things I thought was actually really beautiful and helpful about this document is that it lays out almost a case study of how the articulation of human dignity as a central component of Catholic social teaching and Catholic moral teaching has developed over the history of the church's tradition, starting in antiquity and scripture, and then moving forward um, through to the 20th century, where human dignity was the linchpin concept of Vatican II's declaration, uh, Dignitatis Humanae, human dignity, literally in Latin, uh, but the Declaration on Religious Freedom. Um, So I think it's important to see that there's a really positive understanding and appreciation of the way development of doctrine happens around human dignity here. And the way it's being applied certainly has plenty of challenges. The articulations there may be difficult to hear. Some people are going to feel hurt by them. And that's certainly something that needs to be taken seriously and understood pastorally. But I wouldn't want to leave, you know, sort of, I wouldn't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater here. Um, And I think it's really important to appreciate what's deeply beautiful about this document and laying out a really positive growth within the life of the church to be able to articulate the fullness of human dignity and how central it is to Catholic moral and social teaching. Sam, do you think that this document represents an actual development of Catholic doctrine? Like, is there anything new? I think I would say it represents sort of a consolidation of a development of doctrine, right? I don't think there's anything radically new here in um, in any specific moral claim. It wasn't like, you know, before Monday, the church was fine with uh, sex change and now is not fine with sex change. I mean, I think if you had asked anybody, what is the church's moral teaching on sex change operations, the, the answer would have been, well, the church is opposed to them before Monday still true after the document came out on Monday. Um, I do think what is what might be new here is, you know, Pope Francis has spoken before about um, the need to hold together um, all the, the idea that there are severe violations of human dignity that need to be treated as of deep moral gravity 
and not just cherry picking one issue or another. And particularly, he said this in relationship to how the church stands in opposition to abortion. He said, you know, that issue can't be isolated and made the sole element of the church's moral teaching that we're concerned about. And so I think by putting this together in a declaration, which is a very high level of teaching from the dicastery of the, on the doctrine of the faith, I think that is a new development that we're listing things like war and poverty and also things like abortion and surrogacy and gender theory, whether, you know, debates about whether or not that's the best term to use, but that we're putting those things together and not isolating one of them out for, you know, significant moral concern distinct from the rest. Sam spoke about uh, how some people may be hurt by the articulations in this document. Mike, I was wondering if you could talk to us a bit about the reactions from the LGBT Catholic community and particularly about the sense of whiplash that you wrote about feeling for outreach. Sure. So at Outreach, we consulted with a number of LGBT Catholics, uh, particularly Catholics in the transgender community, to ask how they felt after reading the document. And on the one hand, we heard a lot that people weren't really surprised because, as Sam said, this was pretty widely known, the church's view on issues related to transgender people. Uh, and to see it again, it was disappointing to some people we talked to, but they weren't surprised by it. At the same time, uh, there was this sort of sense of how do we make sense of Pope Francis's pastoral outreach to the LGBT community, including the transgender community, where he's made a special point to meet with transgender people, learn about their lives and experiences, but not see that present in this document. So while there's understanding that it's a teaching document, it's a doctrinal document, uh, there was, I think, a hope that there would at least be some kind of pastoral response, some kind of affirmation of the lived reality, the challenges that uh, especially transgender people face. So I think there was some disappointment that even if the teaching had been understood, at least a nod toward the, the lives and challenges transgender people face. There was also an interesting sort of how do we feel about this? Because on the one hand, the document was, I think, a step forward for the uh, gay and lesbian Catholic community, the, the church calling uh, for uh, Catholics not to support laws that criminalize homosexuality. Uh, Pope Francis sort of made history with that fairly recently, uh, reiterating the church's position that all people deserve to be treated with dignity and respect, including gay and lesbian Catholics. So that was actually seen, I think, as a positive thing, but it was the intro to this uh, more challenging section that I think people had some trouble with. And even the, the creation of the document itself, which Pope Francis sort of broadened out to include some of these other threats to human dignity that uh, we talked about earlier, I think there was probably a pastoral sense there, like let's not have a whole document focused on this one issue related to gender identity. But there was actually some hurt in the community that they would equate the uh, issues around gender identity with things like war and poverty and mistreatment of migrants, sort of, if they're all equally bad, it made a lot of trans people feel, uh, feel bad about uh, what the church was saying about them. So really, I think a confusing uh, week for many in the LGBT community with a lot of uh, hurt and anger and disappointment I think because hopes had been raised so high uh, due to the Pope's uh, really warm embrace of the LGBT Catholic community. Makes a lot of sense. One big critique of this document has been that the gender theory idea that's expressed in this document doesn't seem to cite or accurately represent the field of gender studies. Um, the Vatican document summarizes gender theory as eliminating all differences between men and women, which Obviously, it's not the case for, say, transgender individuals who think that that difference is very important. Uh, so can we discuss that a bit? I guess I'll, I'll throw this to you, Sam. Does the Vatican have an obligation to engage substantively with, with gender theory? Certainly, I think anybody has an obligation to engage substantively with something that they're critiquing. Um, and I think, I think it's difficult uh, to speak specify exactly what gender theory is, or sometimes you hear gender ideology mm -hmm. um, as a, another term for this. And we actually had, uh, we published a great piece by Nathan Schneider about this um, a little while ago at America. And I, I, so I would certainly recommend that piece to folks uh, because it tries to, um, it asks for a sort of a deeper curiosity about what gender theory or gender ideology means. And I can certainly say, you know, from my experience uh, pastorally uh, with people who are trans, um, I'm thinking of several parishioners I know, uh, especially, uh, certainly what the Vatican is describing and what I've heard listening to those people, those are not the same thing. Right. But what I think is there, um, maybe 
sort of under the hood is this question of what is the fundamental relationship of bodily sex, you know, embodied sexual difference to gender as a social construct and in social relationships. And I think at the core of the Catholic understanding of the human person is that we are body and soul together. We are a union of body and soul, not souls in bodies, but soul and body together. That's who we are. And I think that's a very different starting place than a lot of um, secular explanations of how gender works and what gender is, uh, even from a transgender perspective. So I think that's maybe the difference that the document is naming when it's critiquing gender theory, that Catholic the Catholic tradition starts from a different, uh, a different approach to and a, a different kind of reverence for embodiedness itself. I don't have a lot to add to that. I don't think the Vatican has an obligation to do anything. It can certainly issue pronouncements on whatever it wants. I think its arguments are taken most seriously when it shows that it did uh, interact with or uh, really consider the arguments that it's critiquing. And I think that some of the feedback we've gotten in our own reporting and our own uh, articles on this is that from people in the transgender Catholic community, they didn't see in the document any sense of really engaging with transgender Catholics or even trying to understand the latest uh, medical or scientific or uh, kind of sociological understandings of gender and sexuality, which I, I think would have uh, probably made the document a little stronger if people did feel like they saw their own experiences or their own knowledge sort of reflected back, even if it was critiqued. So I'm not sure. The document, again, we talked about it's 20 something pages long and there's really only a few paragraphs around this. So maybe this wasn't the place for that kind of engagement, but there does seem to be a critique out there from some folks in the transgender community and the LGBT academic space that this document really didn't uh, seek to do any serious engagement with uh, science or medicine or sociology. Yeah, and it was certainly a surprising lack after uh, Cardinal Fernandez was presenting this document and said that they had spent, you know, years researching this and trying to keep up with the current uh, current scholarship on it. Um, it was surprising that in the the document's hundred plus footnotes, there wasn't anything, uh, weren't any citations of the arguments that were being countered. I think that there's that's really a mark of um, the academic fields around gender studies and the Vatican uh, really almost talking past each other here. I think because they don't have uh, any kind of shared starting point and the place where they're, the place where those approaches diverge is so fundamental, like so far back um, at the level of metaphysics and a basic understanding of how, of what the human person is and how we get at the identity of the human person. Um, I think really that's where the conversation would need to happen, almost at the level of philosophical underpinnings, more than just have people read the right recent journal articles. Um, but I, I agree that it's it's unfortunate that that conversation doesn't seem to be happening, at least not in a way that is, is being publicly acknowledged or recognized in this document. Right. And we hear that critique uh, connected to Pope Francis's, you know, ministry to, to transgender people like Mike spoke about. We hear it as a critique uh, of synodality. They're, they're saying that there was a lack of, you know, synodal listening to, to people who are affected by this document. One thing that struck me in terms of just the overlooking of transgender people was something really basic in the section where they're reiterating that, you know, uh, no one should be subject to any form of unjust discrimination uh, due to their sexual orientation. They don't say and due to their gender identity or due to their, you know, however much their gender presentation might conform or not conform to their biological sex. I just uh, it, it seemed like a, an oversight there to say, you know, these people should also not be discriminated against. So d two things there. Uh, well, maybe three things. Number one, I think that's a quote. The document is quoting the catechism there. Yes. And I think when is. the catechism was written, when that sentence in the catechism was written, um, you know, trans issues were not as much on the table. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one explanation of that is just, you know, the quote source didn't have it. Um, the second thing is I think the, yeah, I think it would be difficult because of those very fundamental philosophical divergences for the Vatican to use a term like gender identity or gender presentation, um, which is really a term that comes out of, a, well, out of the gender theory, for as problematic as that term is, 
that's where those terms are situated. And the Vatican is trying not to, is saying we need a different way to talk about this. Um, but lastly, I would absolutely affirm, yeah, um, that principle against any unjust discrimination, absolutely, 1000%, that holds for trans people um, in civil life and in the life of the church as well. Yeah, certainly. I think, well, I think that the the exclusion of it, I mean, it gets in part to the criticism that this this document didn't use the term transgender at all. And I can see how, you know, Mike, especially for some of the folks that, that Outreach was consulting uh, around the reactions to this document, that, yeah, they, they feel excluded in part because they're not identified by the, the way that they would prefer to be identified. Yeah, I, I think you hit on something important, too. In my essay at Outreach about the whiplash to LGBT Catholic communities feeling, I mentioned that in 1986, when the Vatican released its letter on homosexuality, there was a dynamic where there was a lot of hurt and anger in the community, but again, not much surprise. It had been pretty clear that the church uh, was headed this way to kind of articulate this moral uh, teaching about homosexual acts. Uh, but what I think did surprise people was the way that this document sort of led to some maybe surprising consequences. So the document comes out and then you have gay and lesbian Catholic groups uh, kicked out of Catholic parishes across the country, citing this very document as a rationale for it. And I think there's some fear here that this document could serve as sort of the launching point to further restrict uh, the visibility or the way that transgender people live out their faith, whether it's uh, in Catholic schools. We've seen a, a lot of movement among different dioceses in implementing uh, policies around gender identity in Catholic schools. Uh, maybe in parishes, are there certain leadership roles that transgender people won't be able to have with this document as the basis? Or even in employment in Catholic healthcare, which has been really struggling to articulate that Catholic hospitals are open and welcoming and respectful to all people, including transgender people, even if certain surgical interventions aren't allowed. So I think that there's some historical uh, considerations about how this document might be used going forward that is causing some fear and anxiety. Uh, and I think you hit on that when, even though there's a reason why transgender people aren't included in that section about not uh, being discriminated against, deserving respect, there could I think be a reason beyond that historical reason. Maybe it is kind of providing an avenue for church leaders in different contexts to further restrict uh, the rights of transgender people in the church. It's an absolutely understandable concern, and I think it's something that we're gonna we're definitely going to see play out um, in different ways in in different national contexts, uh, in different dioceses, even within the same country. Um, but I also think it's important to say. There is nothing in this document that requires the church to discriminate against or exclude transgender people from any part of the life of the church. And, you know, and on the sort of on the side against such exclusion or discrimination, we have the example of the DDF response on transgender people's ability to be godparents. We have Pope Francis's own pastoral example in reaching out to trans people. And I think that those should be taken seriously as well. But yeah, there are always going to be the need to discern carefully about how the church responds in moments like this. And um, so in the one hand, I think the document is leaving open that room for discernment because it hasn't set down strict definitions one way or the other. But I think there's also a, a very natural and understandable sense of hurt and threat uh, for especially trans Catholics because the document doesn't explicitly rule out discrimination against them either. Mike, I want to toss over to you. You were America's national correspondent for many years, and now you're serving as the executive director at Outreach, which uh, both has editorial content and is a media ministry like America is. How do you think editorially about ministering to the LGBT community while also reporting the news and breaking down the declaration uh, this declaration that is, at least in part, directed to LGBT Catholics or, or addresses them. Yeah, I haven't been able to, and I don't want to drop my sort of journalistic instinct at all when I went over to outreach. And the goal for me in terms of how outreach covers something like this is to elevate the voices of LGBT Catholics who are making life work in the church, even if there's some struggles or challenges along the way, and just sort of offer people, um, especially LGBT people who maybe are seeking a home in the church or who are struggling to know what their place is in the church, offer them some examples of people who are making it work in different ways. So when this document came out, what we sought to do was to 
gather voices of LGBT people who are maybe upset about the document or who are challenging some points of it and to kind of get a conversation going. So in the weeks leading up to the document, when we had a confirmation that it would be published, we reached out to some academic types who were able to sort of contextualize the conversation around it. We have a great piece by uh, Stephen Millies, a political theorist, sort of looking at what gender ideology has uh, been used, uh, what, what, what it means by people who use that term, uh, some of the critiques around the term gender ideology. When the document came out, we had a reflection sort of gathering up roundups of uh, what people felt after it was published. And going forward, we're going to have some um, publications that both support the document from a perspective of sort of the broader church teaching on human dignity and more critiques going forward uh, from the lived experiences of people. So we're really hoping to serve as a way for people to engage in deep dialogue about these tricky questions, because it is tempting, I think, to sort of dismiss a document if you feel hurt or challenged by it. But I don't think that's what it means to be Catholic. We have to take these teachings seriously and try to understand what's being said, even if ultimately we can't quite accept uh, what it's trying to put forward. Yeah, I'm excited to see those uh, pieces that you'll be rolling out. We'll certainly be doing the same over at America Magazine. Uh, Sam, sticking in that pastoral kind of vein, this document is certainly more doctrinal than pastoral, as we've said before. Um, that That is to say, it's reiterating Catholic teaching more than it's telling people exactly how to live those teachings. I wonder, does this document change anything for you as a pastor? Well, I mean, I think it it changes some of the questions people are likely to ask me, right? Because sure, um, yeah. one, of, one of the first things you learn in pastoral work is that, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people learn about what the church is doing from headlines and unfortunately not always from headlines in American media, right? Like from headlines at the New York times and CNN and the wall street journal, et cetera. Um, so it, it'll change those questions. Um, but, you know, so I would say two things. Um, one place where where I wish the document had approached something a little bit differently was I wish it had um, had affirmed more clearly, had affirmed explicitly at the same time that it was critiquing gender theory and sex change that transgender people have a place in the church. Mm-hmm. And I mean, and this is this is absolutely still true. Uh, the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith uh, a few months back. Um, put out a response clarifying that transgender people can serve as godparents and sponsors at baptism. Um, so, And this doesn't undo that. This is not a document that is a charter for the exclusion of trans people from the life of the church. But I wish that the document had actually said so, even in the same paragraphs where it was uh, being really critical about um, the things that the church cannot accept. But the other thing I've learned to do, you know, when I've been in pastoral conversations where someone talks about um, some place where they're deeply out of out of step with kind of the what the Catholic norm or the Catholic ideal would be. So this sometimes this can be someone disclosing that they're gay, someone you know who is in a divorced and remarried situation, someone who's trans, something like that. One of the things I've learned to do is not to assume that that is the main pastoral and spiritual issue in their lives. And what I try to do is to remember in a conversation like that, to let my first question be, what is your hope for your life in the church right now? Because sometimes it turns out that what that person really needs is, you know, like to learn to pray more deeply or to have someone accompany them through a grief that is, that is not about this particular tension in their life with the church, but that tension or the impression of that tension has been keeping someone away from the church because they felt like they weren't welcome. And very often, you know, the place to start is they're not coming to a priest because they need to hear me explain, you know, 20 centuries worth of theology about how we got to this particular moral teaching, but because they need someone to pray with or because they you know they need someone to listen to their confession and grant them absolution or because they want to be they want to talk about how do I approach the eucharist um in a situation that is complicated and difficult so yeah um a long way to say it's not just about explaining moral teaching it is about accompanying people in their need for god that's the way i make sense of pope francis's pastoral outreach, really um, profound and beautiful pastoral outreach to trans people, and how does it line up alongside this document, both are still true. And I I wish there had been a more explicit reaffirmation 
of that pastoral outreach and the fact that trans people have a home in the church, but that is absolutely still true. And I think it'll be incumbent on those of us in pastoral work to help reassure people of that. Well, you've both given us so much to think about. So thank you so much. And I really look forward to seeing how this conversation continues in our publications. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Mike. Thank you.